On track two, our next session is a panel discussion on managing and surviving the crisis. This session will be moderated by Mr. Iswara Venkatesam, also known as Venkat, who is Vice President of Development at Ashoka University. Venkat has been long associated with Ashoka University, almost since the project began in 2013. While his principal role is fundraising globally for Ashoka, he has essayed multiple roles at the university. He built a 20 year career prior to joining Ashoka, uh, working in startups and early stage organizations across financial services. And his repertoire includes stints in investment banking, equities, financial research, data analytics, communications. Before I invite Venkar to take over the stage, I'd like to remind you all to please post any questions you have in the Q&A box in the Zoom panel. Great to have you here, Venkat. Over to you. Thank you, Gidanjali. Uh, we have two uh, outstanding business leaders in our midst for the next session, and I'm sure it promises to be quite thrilling. Uh, we will go in alphabetical order, and we have uh, Arindam Bhattacharya first, and I'd like to introduce Arindam. Our second speaker is Rajiv Mamani. I'll come to him in a minute. Uh, Arindam is Managing Director and Senior Partner in India of the Boston Consulting Group, one of the world's leading consulting firms. And uh, Arindam is responsible for industrial goods, the operations, the public sector practices at BCG. He is also a BCG fellow and currently leading the research on radical shifts in globalization and its implications for global firms and is also working with a group of colleagues on the same topic. Uh, Arindam, if you could uh, join the discussion, please. I, I'm very much on and uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present to an audience which I typically don't get an opportunity to present to. Uh, should I start now or are you going to introduce Rajiv? Um, you, you could start, Arindam, and I'll come to Rajiv uh, just after you finish, and I'll introduce Rajiv as well. Okay, so I am going to, uh, I have a few slides that I want to take us through uh, as I speak uh, for about 15 minutes. Uh, as I said, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I have uh, titled this Bringing the Future Forward, and uh, it's very interesting because right now, as you mentioned very briefly, I'm working with a couple of my colleagues to write a book around what we call, what, which is around the, this whole new globalization and implications for our global clients. And I was talking to our CEO uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I was explaining some of the key uh, messages of the book. And he said, the fault lines that you talk about in a society, in our uh, the economic model, uh, in the climate and so on, over, which have developed over the last uh, kind of couple of decades, uh, these fault lines, uh, you know, have been brought forward by COVID, a completely unexpected kind of event. And that's really a very interesting way to think about it. And uh, many people have started talking about not globalization, but talking about what is a post-COVID world. And what I wanted to share with you is really, in some sense, how our clients and businesses are thinking about their uh, life in this post-COVID world and how do they deal with it and what are some lessons that uh, educational institutions and other kind of institutions could also draw from it. Now, I don't want to spend too much time. I'm sure that you have seen some of the numbers, but I just want to leave with one message. This is, uh, this is a uh, kind of unprecedented kind of uh, event that is impacting the world in unprecedented ways. It's impacting 188 countries, uh, 6.4 million people impacted, which is growing. But the question, the interesting thing for us in India is that uh, in many countries, while uh, the doubling rate is actually kind of number of days is increasing and the curve of infection is flattening in India, it is not the case. India's doubling rate is 15 days compared to global average of about 40 days. 
and it's probably going to be with us for some time until we have a treatment or we have a vaccine. So we just need to tune ourselves to what I call the new kind of way of life and normal that we need to protect ourselves, our employees, our colleagues, and uh, our broader ecosystem. So how are our clients and uh, companies thinking about it? They think about it in three very, very different uh, time phases. So there is a phase, what we call, and the three Fs, the phase of flatten, then the phase of fight, and then the phase of thinking about the future or creating the future. Now the flattened phase is where, uh, what is what we actually have in India, which is uh, we are fighting from the health side on flattening the curve. Now in most countries, you start opening up once the curve has started flattening, but in India, we have started opening up uh, before the curve has started flattening. And in the flattened phase, the companies have to be very reactive. They have to move very aggressively in putting in place uh, things, uh, policies around physical distancing. They need to be very, very tuned to customer demand shifts and supply constraints because they suddenly break down. So that's one kind of strategies which are very different from the kind of strategies our clients are putting in place in terms of fight, which could last from 12 to 24 months. And these are a little bit more sustainable strategies where uh, the two key words is really being nimble and agile and innovating your business models in a fairly fluid environment because you really uh, don't know when the vaccine and treatments will get uh, de uh, delivered and so that we are back to a little bit more normal uh, kind of situation. The third lens that all our clients are kind of thinking about is the future. That means uh, post COVID world, as I explained earlier, is not going to be the same as the pre-COVID world in many ways. And I'll come to that. And so you cannot wait for that future to hit you. You need to start thinking about that future now and what is going to be different in that future and uh, in your institutions, in your operating model, in your customer's behavior and start thinking about that now. And as you exit the fight and getting into the kind of future, a little bit more normal kind of economic and health uh, model, you need to start implementing many of those in your own institutions. So that was the first message that uh, if you look at your own institutions, are you thinking in these three very different time frames? The second, and let me go through each one of them, what our clients are and what are the large companies are doing in this uh, kind of time frame. This is about the future. Uh, there are three big trends that are very clearly visible that companies and institutions are beginning to think about. One is the risk. In the last couple of decades, the, our awareness of the risk had actually, we have become a lot of complacent. And suddenly we have been made extremely aware of climate risks, health risks, economic upheavals, and the kind of black swans. You have Fukushima, you had uh, cyclones, you are having bushfires, all kinds of uh, natural and sometimes a man-made economic kind of uh, risks are cropping up more frequently. So how do we build our businesses that are aware and much more sensitive and that can address these risks? The second is there are certain fundamental changes of consumer behavior that has happened during this uh, crisis and was kind of accelerating some of the behaviors that were already underway. And the big question that they're all facing is which shifts in this behavior are going to be permanent and which are not going to be permanent. Uh, and uh, that is a big question. And a very interesting thing is if you look at e-commerce, the China is the number one e-commerce market in the world, but e-commerce in China really took off during the SaaS crisis when supply chains and distributions and retail outlets had to shut down. The same thing is happening now around the world where e-commerce and all the kind of digital services are actually increasing and that will change many businesses. The last thing is actually the role of technology because uh, your operating model systems have to access customers are uh, 
under stress or have been completely locked down, you are having to rethink what is the role of technology in very, very different ways than where we were uh, many kind of uh, pre-COVID or pre-crisis. So these three are the big future trends that uh, our clients are beginning to think about. The second uh, kind of phase, as I said, was fight. Now in the fight, our clients and institutions are thinking about fundamentally risk management in three very different buckets. One is the organizational and people risk, and uh, one is the financial risk. How do you manage your financial risk? And third one is how do you manage a business continuity risk? Because in the phase, if you remember the curve, the economic uh, kind of cycles and stoppages will go up and down. It is not certain what something will happen. So you need to build your businesses to be able to address this risk. In say, in organizational people risk, uh, you know, one of the things that they are doing increasingly is use what we call smart work, remote work. It reduces the cost to the company of uh, salaries and compensation, so on. But remote work or smart work is becoming part of the way you handle risk. Financial risk, uh, you look at uh, conserving cash, as we all know, restructuring your cost and reducing a break-even point. And that is the way you want to like to operate even post-COVID. And the last one is companies are reimagining re their operating model in, in many, many different ways. Uh, for example, one of the key things that they are looking at is something what we call contactless sales. How can you sell without having contact, direct contact with the customers? It's a completely new way of thinking about your operating model. Once again, as you kind of look at your institutions, uh, can you start thinking in these three kind of buckets? for the fight uh, kind of part of your uh, business continuity. The last thing I want to leave a message is in the flatten, and as you go from flatten into fight, one of the things that is absolutely critical, which is where our clients are spending enormous amount of time is uh, when you open operations, what are the SOPs, uh, standard operating processes that you put in place. I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, for an industrial client, a steel company opening up a plant, we developed with them a hundred page SOP. A hundred pages just for a plant. I mean, not the rest of the kind of part of the company, just that. And that includes things like workforce, uh, you know, how do you manage a workforce, uh, how do you do dynamic shop planning, roster planning, and so on. And, you know, even things like, how do you bring people into the plant? What do you do? I mean, one of the things that we found was, so they have extensive gardens. So do you let the gardeners come or do you need to retrain someone to do the gardening? How do you run a canteen? Can you have, uh, you know, steel plates or do you need disposable kind of plates which go away? So those are the minute level of details that uh, you need to develop before you open. And the one very important thing is, can you create rosters of your employees and uh, colleagues where you can limit the risk? So if someone gets an infection, you know that he's been in touch with only a certain set of people, not everyone within that uh, institution. So. I hope uh, these four messages, one is you need to look at in three phases. Second is you need to think of the future. Third one is look at the risk in three different buckets. And fourth is have very detailed SOPs as you think about opening up your own institutions. And I just want to leave the last thought with you as you think about your future. How do your consumers think about yourself? What is the role of physical assets because they increase your uh, your break-even points, and last, as work practices, as the way you uh, build digital skills and learn, that is changing dramatically. What does that mean for the this sector, education sector, and uh, how do you take some lessons from there to apply to and think about your future? So let me stop here. I'm sure that you would have some questions, which I'm very happy to answer as we go forward. Thank you, Arindam. Really appreciate this. 
Uh, we will get back to you and Rajiv in a minute uh, with the Q and A's uh, once Rajiv uh, finishes his presentation and conversation. Uh, so I request you to um, switch off your uh, camera and I'll invite Rajiv Mimani on to the panel. Uh, Rajiv Mimani is the chairman and CEO of ENY in India. Rajiv is also EY's global executive board and chairman of the Emerging Markets Committee. Rajiv has been part of several advisory committees of the government of India, and most recently was a member of the task force that drafted a new direct tax law in 2019, which by the way was a great piece of legislation. He is associated with prominent businesses and industry associations and is board member of IIM Sirmaur, one of India's premier uh, management schools. Rajiv, welcome to the panel. Uh, we'd love to hear your views and your presentation. Yeah, I, I was just sharing and echoing what Arindam was saying. We seldom get a platform like this. And uh, uh, in fact, I have, this is the first time I'm addressing uh, uh, you know, uh, people who run and manage schools. Uh, so uh, I will I'll quickly kick off. Thank you very much, uh, 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 you know, for giving uh, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, can I just request if they can if someone could put the slides on and if you can go to the next slide, please. So Arendam discussed this. I don't uh, don't want to repeat this. I think all of us are, are aware of this, but I would just say that. Uh, uh, you know, this is probably the single largest uh, economic and health crisis that we have seen um, uh, in sort of modern history in some ways. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the end, unless the, the health problem gets solved, I think the end is clearly uh, not in immediate sight. Uh, uh, in so far as India is concerned, I think uh, Arindam very well captured uh, what's happening. Uh, the only thing I would say that once we recover from 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 the health side, uh, you know, I, I do remain optimistic uh, on where India is likely to be. I think we have a low interest environment. Commodity prices are low, oil prices are low, uh, and the world is pivoting towards digital and technology, which I think is India's competitive advantage. And with the global supply chains changing, I think that if India can capture that opportunity, then along with demographics. Uh, those could be long-term sustainable advantages. But in, in, in achieving that, the path to that, uh, I think it's a tough, challenging path uh, for the next, um, I would say, for the next six months at least, uh, if, not, uh, if not longer. Can we just uh, uh, check the slide, please? Yeah. So this is what, in some ways, uh, Arindam also described this. Um, uh, you know, as we look at it, the, the, the world will change, has changed. Uh, and a lot of people do ask whether, you know, what is the permanence of this change? And I do believe that some of these things will change uh, very significantly. And I think there will be a new normal. So insofar as industries are concerned, I think the emphasis on, on digitization, uh, on more flexible cost structures, a much greater focus on business resilience uh, will be there. Markets, uh, you know, the impact of trust of goodwill uh, will be much, much more than what we have seen before. And in terms of societies, uh, uh, you know, employees and consumer behavior will change. So much greater focus on wellness, much greater focus on health, um, and, you know, acceptance of digital technologies uh, in day-to-day -day lives will be far more greater. And we, we characterize this as a quality economy. So, you know, as, you know, rather than just sort of singularly focusing on growth, uh, I think the focus would probably be much more on growth and other elements of it. So, you know, I much greater focus on sustainability, much greater focus on virtualization. And I would say that much greater focus on broader stakeholder group. Uh, the inequality fissures have been exposed much more than what we had ever seen before. And, and I would say that in, especially in democracies, governments and policymakers will come out with rules and laws that will address inequality. And I think to, the, to that extent, the impact that it has uh, in our own individual businesses, uh, in our personal day-to-day -day dealings, I think we should factor that in as we go forward. Can I request you to change the slide, please? Yeah. 
So uh, we've, we've char characterized this into now, uh, next and beyond. And I think now is probably what all of you have already done. Whenever as the crisis struck, you know, first thing was really to look at the safety of your employees, ensuring that you are continuing to uh, uh, serve uh, your customers and other stakeholders uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a manner that doesn't expose to health risks. And the third was really conserving cash because uh, that that was very important for uh, for survival. As we look at the next phase and probably uh, you know next and beyond kind of overlap, but I think where we are today, uh, clearly as uh, was was has been mentioned that most companies, most industries across industries are looking at accelerating digital adoption, and this is not just for one part of your business, but this is across all elements of business and the key thing that is engaging companies right now one of the key things is really how does this impact their business and what do they need to do to turn this into a competitive advantage and and i think <coughs> yes, uh, you can look at the most mundane businesses commodity businesses like steel business or aluminium business or anything power power and utility power plants consumer businesses financial services services businesses it's it's pervasive right through the second thing is, you know, the flexibilization of workforce. So people are unfortunately looking at multiple measures, including, uh, I would say, uh, you know, redundancies that they create have been created and how they deal with that, uh, how they deal with a much more uh, a volatile world. So, you know, how do they variableize their cost base? How do they variableize their employee base? You know, whether number of days of working, whether greater variable costs, greater bonuses as compared to fixed costs and other things. And in some cases also looking at reducing compensation. So I think this entire approach of zero based budgeting is very critical in sort of looking at lowering cost bases right now. So I think that's something that organizations are looking at. And finally, as people look at their, uh, uh, you know, once they get through this, they're also saying, so as consumer behaviors change, as organizations change, as government change, what does this mean really for my business? And every organization, every company is looking at well, how does this, uh, you know, and, and, you know, there's some very interesting examples. For example, for the first time you had an A-lister Bollywood movie, uh, Gulabo Sitabu being released on Amazon Prime, uh, national wide release. You have, uh, uh, even if you were to look at, uh, you know, some uh, restaurants or, you know, uh, fine gourmet restaurants, they are looking at trying to say, how do they send frozen dishes? How do they create experience, gourmet experiences at home? How do they do, uh, you know, do it yourself meal kits? So everyone is trying to say, uh, what they can do. CureFit, which is, you know, a, a, a gym, a physical gym is now trying to say, how do they monetize their gym platform? What do they need to do that? So every organization, every company uh, is trying to see how uh, uh, this whole thing, uh, uh, you know, will impact their businesses. The the other thing is, uh, is you know, how do you build a more resilient enterprise? So Arinda mentioned that uh, risk was low on the radar, you know, uh, singular focus was largely on growth. And I think that will change. Uh, so business resilience uh, in its various elements, whether it's financial resilience, uh, whether it's resilient, uh, resilience against other events that can happen, will become a very integral part of how people plan for the future. Can I request you to move this next slide, please? Thank you. May maybe we can move this and we can go to... So I'm now coming more to what's happening, what we are seeing happening in the education uh, system. So, so what we are seeing, uh, and, and this is just very quick of which parts of the world which have remained open, which have shut down and reopened. And when they have reopened, like in Singapore, you know, some companies are saying running on alternate days, uh, schools or running in different shifts. And some countries uh, have either announced post July openings and some haven't. And I think if you read the Times of India, front page today, I think it's clear that in India, probably uh, school opening will happen um, at the far end as compared to what we see around the world. And there are various parameters uh, which globally people are looking at, including health context, economic uh, adaptability of schools. What is the stakeholder con uh, consensus on this? So, so I think it looks like that uh, reopening of schools in India will probably be at the tail end as compared to uh, other countries in the world. Yeah, can I have the next slide, please? So we did we did a a survey of uh, uh, of parents uh, just to for them to for to understand, uh, and this was a pretty wide survey uh, to understand what have been the implications 
for their children and this is meant for k-12 uh, school students uh, uh, annual fees ranging from anywhere between 20,000 rupees to 5 lakh rupees. Uh, and um, about 55% of the parents surveyed said that the schools have moved on to uh, uh, digital learning. Uh, and 30% uh, said that schools have been uh, completely uh, uh, suspended. And the ones that had uh, moved on to digital learning, you know, largely it was most of it uh, was, synchronous, uh, was synchronous learning. From a communication standpoint, uh, uh, most parents were quite happy actually in the way the communication was happening through emails, through WhatsApp, on websites, on, on portal, emails on websites and portals. But the, the, the levels of satisfaction were much higher where the, uh, where the interactions were more with parent bodies through, through Zoom links and, uh, and, and also uh, taking care of some of the key demands that uh, 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 that people, uh, uh, you know, that uh, key demands that parents had. The, the second question was on how use of technology uh, tools was happening. And I said, most of them were looking at synchronous uh, teaching. 80% of the parents were uh, qu uh, quite happy with it. I think doubt clearing was a challenge because the teachers were busy sort of uh, uh, doing, uh, spending their time in, um, in, uh, in doing the live lectures. Uh, so uh, what uh, what people felt was going forward was that you know you probably we will be seeing more recorded lectures, and the time taken the balance time being taken to really clear the doubts and and uh, so the benefit of digital tools right now were mostly focused on dealing with the crisis rather than accelerating learning process in a significant way. But in spite of that, the satisfaction levels were very high. On teaching quality, also the satisfaction levels were very high. Uh, with uh, assignments, tests, homeworks were all being done uh, uh, more uh, uh, more digitally. Uh, I, you know, the issues and concerns that parents had uh, was obviously they felt this is not a sustainable way, most of them, because of lack of social interactions. A lot of them felt that face-to-face -face, uh, teaching was much, uh, much more important. And I think there was this whole issue of financial assistance. So 70% of the parents that we surveyed uh, had uh, received, uh, uh, th there was no fee reduction. There was an anticipation of fee reduction because of work from home. Uh, and 30% of uh, the parents did not, uh, uh, had some uh, uh, some kind of financial relief that was given. And I think people, and I think has been decided in the courts also now, have understood the challenges uh, that schools uh, are, are also facing. So going forward, uh, I would say that uh, a digital learning and tool will probably become that was the learning will become an integral part of, of education and whilst it will be uh, difficult to raise fees uh, going forward uh, there would be uh, i think uh, schools should be looking at if they can uh, you know maybe easier payment options and everything else i think just to ensure that that uh, uh, yeah you know the satisfaction levels uh, stay higher provided obviously it's it's feasible to do that we can just move to the next slide and this if we use uh, what happens from a school standpoint into into now next uh, and beyond and i think some of which um, has been covered by arindam so i will not uh, uh, cover everything that's been covered but i would say uh, blended learning uh, uh, is definitely so a combination of online and physical is is, is the way to go uh, the second thing uh, is, uh, you know, digital would also entail all school processes, whether it's an admission process, whether how you're looking at uh, attracting new students. Uh, I think technology will play a very, very important role. So not only in content, but in the way the school is run, function, the, the LMS systems that we have, I think they, they, they will be a much more blend towards technology. I think schools uh, and I think uh, institutions like Ashoka can play a great role, should look at evaluating uh, strategic partnerships with digital providers because the ed tech companies are really now seeing great growth. I think even telecom providers like uh, Geo or an Airtel and some of the others should look at how some of the shared infrastructure can be created uh, by so that the financial cost on schools uh, is 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 reduced as they move towards the uh, uh, more online system. And I think that's something that we should watch out for. And I think there is great opportunity to create some of these uh, common platforms. Uh, as company, as schools look at sort of planning for the future, I think they should really look at trying to see how they can reduce the expenditure on physical assets, but try and much more focus on building up digital assets and capabilities. 
And finally, I would say that uh, 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 you know capital spends uh, should be watched very very carefully, and there should be uh, refocus or remodification of capital uh, of capital spends. And schools should actively look at uh, how they can explore. Uh, alternative uh, finances, uh, some subsidies that the government has given for SMEs or some other uh, alternative financing that they should look at. So that's what I uh, I wanted to cover. I'll pause here and uh, pass it back to you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, this is most insightful. Uh, we welcome uh, Arindam back on the panel so both of you uh, can take questions. We have a bunch of questions, and some of them are uh, incisive, and some of them are worrisome. Uh, and I'll pose the first question to Arindam. Uh, Arindam, people are worried about jobs, right? Uh, what happens to kids who come out of schools these days? And there are large numbers in India. And India is divided into two halves. We have the urban India and the rural and the suburban India. What will happen to the quantum of jobs and what will happen to the nature of jobs? And what does the school education system need to do to enable students to grapple with that question? It's a fundamental and a complex question. I'm sure Rajiv also has <laughs> you can point new. You know, even before, as I said, the forge lines around job creation and the role that technology has been playing and the fear that that it has inculcated uh, was already beginning to kind of uh, become visible. And it has only become uh, more acute because of the economic slowdown and the destruction of jobs that has happened because of both the health and the economic slowdown and lockdowns coming together at the same time. But having said that, my two or three points that I'd like to make and which is very relevant for uh, the schools. One point is the structural shift in the nature of work was already underway. And uh, the, the interesting thing is still now, if you look at the industrial society, technology has always been an enabler and has been an enabler of creating new kind of means of increasing productivity and that has led to increasing improvement in uh, all our lives across countries. Now technology is no more just the enabler, it is in some senses becoming a partner and in BCG we use a term bionic where uh, technology, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning and humans actually work together and uh, create value which uh, then obviously benefits the society. Now that has a profound implication in terms of kind of jobs, how the jobs will be performed, and uh, you know uh, what is the role of learning and education in this society. And uh, I think, as I said, the future has been pulled forward and we need to think seriously about it. Just as an aside, I, I remember asking a question to a dean of one of the top universities in the US saying that, why do you still have in kind of school and uh, college structures, university structures, which are set 200 years ago. And he said, for people like us, because there is more demand than supply and we don't have a burning platform to change. And the question to my, I mean, kind of what I'll pose is, is the burning platform here today that we really need to rethink? And some of the things that Rajiv said in terms of just rethinking. Now, jobs, there's structural change in the work and structural change of our job in the economies are going to get created. It's no more going to be large companies with formal jobs. It is going to be increasingly digitally aided service jobs in smaller companies, micro enterprises and uh, entrepreneurs. And so there is a very different structural change in the jobs and the way you learn skills are also changing. So I would say that uh, a next phase of job creation will come. We are going through a transition phase, which hopefully if we have the right set of policies will uh, accelerate the transition. If we don't, then I, I do think we'll have a challenge in, in the interim. Rajiv, a question for you. Uh, and uh, Arindam, thanks a lot. 
Rajiv, a question for you. What happens to the jobs of teachers? Uh, I think teachers are also worried, saying, hey, uh, for so many years, I've been a good teacher. I've been teaching history in a classroom. And suddenly, the world seems to be shifting. Um, what does this online shift or a paradigm shift mean for school teachers? And I also think school teachers are worried about their jobs. And, and I want to add on another question is, what happens to compensations of teachers given the fact that there may be cost pressures on schools? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. Um, uh, and I think it's not only true for teachers, I would say it's generally true for all of us. Uh, that as, uh, as Arindam mentioned, in this sort of world of technology, AI, ML, and, and individual interaction, uh, you know, what, what really happens to the human role? And I would say that, uh, uh, you know, from a teacher standpoint, from being pure, someone who was purely doing content delivery, my sense is successful teachers will be much, will have to be doing much greater role of enablement, acting as a catalyst, because the content will be available uh, in various formats. The question is how they can customize to the individual student, because the content will struggle to do that. How they can uh, be an enabler in a catalyst in building the right set of mindset, which is required for someone for uh, you know a, a child for, for, for tomorrow. I think those will be the key roles uh, that teachers will have. So I think from being pure content provider to someone about obviously knowing content very well, but being an enabler and a catalyst and customizing to the individual uh, student will become increasingly more and more important. Uh, uh, so I, I think that will be there. In terms of uh, 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 compensation, when you have a contraction of GDP of to the extent of you know minus 5%, 6%, who knows that number is, and a decline of per capita income of uh, you know first time which India will be experiencing, the, the challenge Ishwar, is that we, we are for the first time as a country, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the global countries, economies in the world have seen more volatility than what India has. India has really seen a graph which has gone upward. So our, our mindset is on that basis. I think for the first time, and this is a real challenge for business managers, entrepreneurs, for everyone, you're seeing a contraction in the economy, you're staring you know, a hard recession on its face. And I think we will have to, uh, you know, some income levels, uh, if the income levels across economies will drop, per capita income will drop, they will drop. Uh, and I think we'll, uh, we will have to see how do we retool ourselves, uh, you know, how do we prepare ourselves for things going forward. And I'm sure, as I mentioned earlier, you know, things will get better. Uh, and I think the p positive mindset is is what is required in dealing with this situation. I think that's, that's what I think. I think... Uh, 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 declining income levels for a large part of India will be a reality. Uh, Arindam, a question for you. Historically, you want, Arindam, you're saying something? So did I interrupt you? No, no, no. A uh, question for you, Arindam. The world has seen pandemics before. The world has seen wars before. I was asking the Chancellor of Ashoka, he's a historian. I said, what happened during the Second World War from 1939 to 1945? He said, well, Cambridge and Oxford didn't teach because the young folks joined the army and both men and women. And so the universities did teach, but guess what? Uh, they have the largest enrollments now going forward. Is this a shorter term phenomenon? And once we see the exit of COVID and a resolution of the issue, do you see some parity returning to the world and some of the, the, the vexations of today might actually take a back seat? I, I personally don't think so. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the fault lines in the post-World War II growth of globalization has started becoming extremely visible and stark. Uh, the social inequality, the climate uh, kind of under pressure because of the resource intensiveness of our whole industrial and policies and life, uh, the way we uh, consume and live, uh, you know, some of the geopolitical tensions that are coming up. I mean, the first time you have, uh, and every time uh, hegemony is challenged and we are in a situation where the hegemony is being challenged at the end of World War II, it wasn't. And so in some sense, all of these are coming together 
and then we haven't seen the kind of technological disruption that we are seeing today particularly with the launch of as i said ai and ml for the first time uh, the decisions are being taken by technology which in some cases are better than what the decisions humans take it has never happened before so this is not a normal kind of transition and uh, the challenge is our mindset our mental models and our institutions and processes will have to transition we are not i mean humans like status quo they want to normalize but uh, you know my own sense is the events will uh, kind of uh, crowd us and we will have to find a way to be able to deal with uh, this future coming forward and uh, it will be and along with the economic crisis i think we'll we are in an i mean it's not a very positive message but uh, we the earlier we can find an answer and resolve this questions in our mind and find an answers to this there are still enormous opportunity for growth enormous opportunity for job creation but a new job creation and that transition the fast uh, the faster we can make it uh, the better it is and i'll just give you one simple example analogy technology and good regulations actually created the telecom industry in india until bad regulations uh, created a lot a bigger mess the way you can harness technology you can create and it was completely new industry for india and there are so many such new industries i think which are waiting to be uh, kind of grown by the right mix of regulations markets and technologies that uh, i'm not too worried about jobs but there will be new jobs and there will be new uh, skills that are required for those jobs rajiv i have got another question for you but in response to what arindam has said if we were to crystal ball gaze 3 years from now the question i have for you is are we reacting too much do you think the world will come back to a certain sense of normalcy yeah no i uh, my my uh, in some ways i share uh, some views with arindam in some ways slightly different so i would say that uh, uh, the world uh, will come to some semblance of normalcy i mean it will be a new normal but there will be a sense of normalcy that will definitely come and the role and the hand that technology will play will be much stronger than what we have seen before and uh, and hopefully every uh, whether when industrial revolution happened and when other big changes have happened you know it has led to a more uh, greater productivity uh, hopefully a uh, greater uh, uh, you know job creation and i think that's where i i believe india's strength in technology india demographics of india uh, and if we can if we can if we can uh, manage this along and if we can move fast enough for this change uh, get the regulatory mechanisms in place um i think there is a big opportunity uh, for for countries uh, like india uh, uh, and uh, what what one saw in manufacturing i think now there's an opportunity great opportunity to see in technology obviously technology is going to uh, play a role not only as an individual uh, stool but in almost every industry uh, that we will see so i'm uh, you know i do believe that uh, if we have the right regulatory response uh, the healthcare uh, uh, you know the vaccine comes out in the next uh, uh, 12 months or so i do think that there will be a bounce back uh, you know 3 years from now there is a question uh, thanks rajiv thanks hmm. yeah arindam were you saying something no 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 okay arindam a question for you um, do you see a shift in the kind of teaching that's going to be delivered in the classrooms to prepare students for different kinds of jobs so do you, therefore the question is our our skill based uh, teaching going to see a greater dominance than a, a bit of a generic learning that's been happening in classroom so far i think many of us know that that is as it should be uh because uh, increasingly it is very clear that uh, a lot of the companies that even hire from colleges or even from schools they have to do a lot of retraining and reskilling the other thing that is really happening is where the jobs particularly if you look at organized sector jobs and income jobs in companies then even other institutions uh 
the reskilling and uh, what we call upskilling and reskilling on a dynamic level, not just pushing it, but pulling. That means the individual himself or herself would like to upskill or reskill themselves for a new role is increasing. So the way you learn or in companies, uh, that's a big shift. And uh, if and how we bring that in into our schools, I think is going to be important. We have to create what I'll call vocationalizing and technology coming together to create uh, ways that uh, our uh, children can actually decide where and how they want to develop their own uh, kind of career going forward. And it is not going to be kind of, uh, you have decided once and that is what you have to be. You have to keep on reskilling and upskilling in that role. And how do you create a education learning uh, kind of institutional uh, framework to be able to do that is going to be important. The question, and I, I, mean, I mean, Rajiv has a point of view, I think our regulators in most uh, areas, be it banking, be it education, be it health, and others are far behind it. They are unable to really understand and uh, what I call conceptualize and then bring back what is required to be done to be able to prepare they are often reacting to events and situations that uh, are suddenly upon us and how do we make that how do we make that change and education system education uh, regulators how do we make that change is going to be a very important part which will determine uh, you know success or failure of this rajiv the qu i have a question uh, which is based on arindam's answer but this is uh, also an independent question is if we have to uh, retool, it would essentially mean, uh, you know, the lack of resources for schools across the length and breadth of India, right? Uh, so some of these schools in in the suburban areas or the rural areas may not have the the money or the infrastructure to retool to the skills that are in the most talking about. That's part one. And part two is there has been a reverse migration of a large number of people from urban centers back to the villages, right? And what does that mean for the education system? I mean, what happens to the kids of these parents who've gone back to the villages? Uh, is that a fundamental shift that's happening in India? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it'll tough, be tough for me to answer the second one. Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the impact and implications of that. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, I mean, the, the, on the first one, uh, uh, you know, the government, uh, you know, is looking at coming up and will, and I think this is where uh, uh, people like you and me have to engage and interact with government to, they will have to create common platforms. Uh, so whether the government is looking at creating, say, something like Diksha uh, and other platforms, uh, which will help reduce the cost for schools to access technology, access the new age skills that are required. Uh, and, uh, and I think there is also an opportunity for schools to explore partnerships. Uh, I mean, I see, I mean, hypothetically, uh, you know, if I were to say, uh, you know, if I was to partner with a telecom company or I was partner with an ed tech company who charges on a very nominal basis, if they're going to, I mean, India, the advantage that India mm -hmm. has is that India has roughly both, both, more than 300 million learners. I mean, they, no one has that kind of scale. So question is, can I create technology platforms? Can I work with a telecom company in a particular geography and say, okay, if you standardize content and if you wire a school to provide, at least give the technology infrastructure to the school or find a way that, you know, if the, if the students are taking a particular kind of service that you subsidize some form of that service and everything else, provided there is connectivity for a period of time. I think those are the kind of innovative solutions that India will have to come out with as they look at, uh, because schools can, you're absolutely right, schools cannot afford this. Uh, there is political uh, pressure as, and as income levels go down, there will be great resistance to any level of fee increases. Affordability will be under challenge. So therefore, the only way is to look at your existing cost structures carefully and see how much you can allocate and look at collaborations and partnerships. 
which don't every school by school you may not want to do but at a platform level that's something that we'll have to do so i'm hopeful that in 6 months 12 months time if there are people who come out of this and say that you know let's try and create a framework whereby we can approach some of these big companies because what we are also seeing is that uh, in all this process the strong is are getting stronger and and there's a lot of middle layer that's going away so you will have large corporations in edtech large co- corporations in technology in telecom that will come that they will have the wherewithal they will have the muscle to provide the infrastructure support that's required question is how do we create meaningful uh, uh, you know uh, ecosystem partnerships uh at an affordable level so i mean arindam gave a great example of telecom i can see part of that you know uh, can be replicated in education as well i have one last question sorry sorry arindam no i, I mean may, may just add one uh, one thing to raj or rajiv said that if you look at uh, digital technology based platforms uh, and you compare that and say that that's uh, the in some sense the infrastructure the 21st century as a physical infrastructure the road the you know ports and all were in the 20th century technology infrastructure like that has the potential to reduce cost per unit by anywhere up to 10x to 100x so right. if you can create that platform the delivery of the same output can come down enormously and that is really the question how do you fund that platform as a as a public good rather than individuals or groups of kind of uh, trying to do that and that to me would be where uh, government and policy makers and regulators need to start thinking about the whole education system we have less than 2 minutes to go and i'll ask a common question to both of you arindam and rajiv a short answer do uh, owners of small and independent schools stand alone schools do they need to worry about their existence or do you think there might be pressures and they may need to consolidate with other schools or just wind down because the cost pressures are going to be real arunda look it's it's not that the individual schools i think the same pressures are there with a lot of uh, small business entities and uh, my point would be to them is you cannot just stand still and operate at the same cost levels uh, that you were pre crisis you need to innovate your business models and also your costs to be able to survive and thrive and you can do that today uh, that has to be the objective that you take you have to think out of box to be able to do that rajiv uh, your response to the cost pressures is the same same is the same what are in the message that i think uh, change is definitely there i i i don't think i question survival but i do say that for survival uh, significant change Uh, is important uh, whether that change uh, and i would say a lot of that change is uh, is very doable at an individual school level some of that may necess- necessitate uh, some level of uh, consolidation as well thank you um, arindam and rajiv we are very grateful for the time that you've given us our session has come to an end we are uh, we look to be in conversation further so if we do another version of this we'd love to welcome you back Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. Thanks Venkat. Thank you. Great. Thank you everyone. Great platform. Thank you very much. Thanks.